fire. I get involved with the sound design very early on. When I'm doing picture cutting, I like to have a library of sound effects that I can throw right into the cut, as the picture and the sound need to evolve simultaneously. So we brought Chris Boys, sound designer, on very early, two years ahead of time. We developed this huge library of sounds, all different sounds from wing flaps, and banshee screeches, and then I just slapped them against picture. So in a way, my selection process was not a review process. I was actually cutting. I'd say, oh, I like that sound. I'd put that in. And that's how I created the specific vocabulary, drawing from sounds that Chris had proposed for these different things. While the sound that we've created may have originated from an animal or a, a jungle ambience or even a helicopter, by the time that my crew has taken it and we manipulate it in such a way that it becomes something unique to Avatar that has a grounding in reality so that the audience can sort of understand the sound and relate it to the real world. The interesting thing about Pandora is that it's got to be a hyperactive, bioluminescent jungle. So you're given license to get really wild with the sounds, with the sounds of the bugs flying by, with the sound of distant creatures off in the jungle somewhere. Just with the dripping of the leaves and everything, you can get sort of more immersed in it, and you're allowed to let sound sort of play that role of wrapping you up in this world. This jungle is so saturated with colors and things floating in the sky that you've never seen before. For instance, the first time that Jake finds himself lost in the forest, you hear distant calls from all around of creatures that you can't really put your finger on what this creature is, but it's not a comforting call. And meanwhile, as you go down into the forest, you hear sort of sounds of scurrying animals all around you, but you can't really figure out where they're coming from. <laughs> and at the same time, the entire forest itself is alive, almost as if the leaves and the trees are sort of moving and swaying and breathing in the immediate surroundings. The banshee, to some extent, I sort of related it to a flying horse, if you will, because like a horse, it's a creature that is wild and then becomes domesticated like a horse. The cry itself was the hardest part. I experimented with a tremendous amount of large raptors, birds, as well as a lot of baby creatures, baby uh, cougars, baby swine, baby cubs of various different natures. And I just started building a palette of calls and sent them down to Jim, and he started picking some of the ones that he liked. People have talked a lot about the Navi language and what it took to build the Navi language. They never talked about the Banshee language, but there is a Banshee language. It makes all kinds of different sounds, and those sounds mean different things. There's the distant call. And then there's a kind of a greeting cry. And there's a threat hiss and they have different levels of aggression. And then there's a kind of little squeaky shriek that it makes when it's stressed and it submits away from an encounter. And then there's a threat display, roar. If you think of the banshee as being this bird the size of a Cessna, the Leonoptrix is a sort of 747 and it's massive vocal that not only can it cry out, but when it cries out, the entire universe hears it. This huge, chesty, rumbling cry with a sort of very powerful note of terror in it. The wing flaps were another really fun thing that I think worked out really well in that, you know, they've got to cut the air with a very crisp, clean sound, but at the same time, they have to be pushing enough air that you really feel this thing has the power to do these incredible maneuvers. Go, go! The dire horse was a sound that Gary Rydstrom and I created that as a bark element for a creature in Jurassic Park. Jim liked that sound, and so I took 
some walrus and African crane sounds and sort of created the same thing doing with different creatures. And in the end, we sort of went back to the original recording of the mating tortoise and developed a new version of it. And now in the film, there's a little bit of both, but they all live in the same sort of world and it's very much a honking bark. <laughs> The Thanator is a medley of a lot of different animals. For instance, the footsteps were developed by taking large cat prancing around his cage. And it has a leopard cry that's very much its signature. I remember reading the script and thinking, oh no, this guy's gotta be really badass same time have a lot of components based in rage but also sort of raging frustration <laughs> the Valkyrie is very much a component of a rocket and a jet and there's a really fun scene in, in the very beginning of the film when they descend down to Pandora. And it's a sweeping, epic moment. We sort of built the rocket rumble to be this big, low-end, weighty component, and then the, the jet component, sort of a high-frequency component, to leave room for the music to breathe and live. And it's very effective. One of the craziest aircraft in the film is the Dragon, which Courage flies. Jim described initially as having a very strong turbine component and then the rotor chop. We built all sorts of different sounds of the Dragon, the Samson, and the Scorpion. And it was important to us that you could tell, that's a Samson, that's a Scorpion. We've been recording guns for years now, and we've recorded a lot of new ones for this film. And Jim is very adamant that they sound appropriate to what they're firing. And so the amp suit has to sound like the most massive cannon you ever heard. Then when you go back to, you know, say, Corridge's machine gun, on. really want to have that be very live and very poppy and bright and articulate, so that's very much like a machine gun that we would hear here on Earth. The toughest challenge has been the final mix, because we have literally hundreds and hundreds of layers of sound, and it's finding what maybe five or six layers Jim really wants to hear. And getting all those components with this incredible score and with the dialogue and putting that all together. And still keeping the path that Jim sort of built in his temp mix has been a challenge. But I have to say at the same time, I have the greatest crew on the planet so that we can achieve what Jim wants. All right, let's turn up the heat. I actually had started thinking about the movie and, you know, uh, trying to do some ideas for the movie. Then I took a bunch of stunt people on our own and we started doing some ideas for the film. Uh, and then I finally got to come in and meet, you know, uh, John Landau and, you know, James Cameron. Go. They looked at some of the stuff I had done and, you know, thought it was interesting and, you know, I thought, let's, you know, use you as a stunt coordinator. And so I got to read the script and then we started choreographing. Okay, so pull him in, headbutt, smacked inside of his leg. We brought in a lot of different stunt performers, you know, male and female. We had to design not just the stunts, but also the movements that would be associated with the Navis. These creatures on this planet can move like lemurs, jumping from limb to limb on a tree and run as fast as any kind of panther or cheetah you'd see through a tree and move like a cat, but still they're two-legged human-like creatures. So we had to design fight scenes that would help those movements out. 
We had about a month and a half to start doing some kind of training with the actors, you know, before the movie. We worked with them on how to fly with a wire, you know, run and jump with a wire and, you know, do some of the different movements and fights. It's a lot more difficult than I would have thought. We had to constantly be on them every day about how they were fighting. We had to take Sam and teach him how to be military as well, so we got him a military trainer. So someone came down and showed him what it's like to hold a gun and all the other things that would be associated with being a Marine, which is the character here. Sam's a surfer, and so when I started talking about flying the Banshees and the Leonoptrix like a, like a board sport, like this kind of athletic thing, he really got into that. And so when it came time to ride the Leonoptrix, he's got this whole other thing, because he has to fly, he has to hold on with one hand, and he has to fire a 30 caliber machine gun, door gun from the helicopter with his other hand. So Sam and I worked together to come up with these kind of surf-based moves. Zoe was great with movement, you know. We taught her how to run, how to jump on a wire, how to shoot her bow. I love it. I was a dancer for 10 years, and I always wanted to do a film where I was physically challenged, not only mentally. Garrett, he has this vast knowledge. Not only can he do like a martial art thing and, and not make it look really artsy, and he can also do like a natural thing without making it look too primitive, and it's sort of like a blend. Good. There was a person that we used to teach her wushu, and his name was Keith Cook. The wushu training lent itself greatly toward these Navi beings because, you know, that Chinese style deals with animal styles. So we wanted them to have more of a animal kind of a movement while still being human being-ish. The biggest set pieces for the stunt department really have been this thing that we call the beanstalk, which is actually a bunch of huge rocks entwined inside of vines that are being held and suspended in air by mountains. And, and we have to go through uh, not just climbing rocks, but also how to climb through the vines and, you know, jump from space to space because the rocks aren't together. You know, they have to be able to jump from one rock to the next rock and then climb vines the way that the Navis would. We have one fantastic performer, his name is Ilram Choi. He's got to be able to do not just a flip and a spin in the air and hit the ground, but Ilram gets to be Sute's double. But also, sometimes we might use him to do a move for Natiri. He might be a hunter, or he'll be a soldier. He was even one of the amp suits that was being developed in the beginning of the movie. Uh, another stunt performer, Alicia Vailability. She's a gifted dancer slash uh, gymnast slash stunt performer. She's doubling Natiri, um, but she also gets to double, you know, other female performers and sometimes even a soldier here or there. Yeah. Another stunt performer that we have is Ruben Langdon. Great stunt performer. Hits the ground harder than anybody I know. We had our, our uh, virtual stunt team, and then we had our live action stunt team, and they were run by uh, Alan Poppleton. Garrett had sent me down his breakdown, stunt breakdown, and um, different scene numbers that we had to work on, different gags that were related to those scenes. Door gunners are getting pulled out of Samson choppers by banshees. Also some stuff that happens in the dragon stunts and sequences where troopers are getting taken out. Probably the most technical movie I've been on. A challenge for everybody, but I think it's going to be a wicked product at the end. Jim's great, he's a practical person. He's either on the camera or he's getting in there showing the actor how they should be falling over or how they should be holding the weapon. And he's very clear on what he wants and what he doesn't want, but definitely keeps you on your toes. I have the best time as far as helping the stunt performers or the actors, as far as flying the Banshees or flying the Leonoptrix. All those things are great because they don't exist, really, except for in Jim's mind. So, you know, Jim has told us exactly what it is and how they'd ride it. I mean, he has a very detailed explanation about everything. He started down to the little bones in their anatomy. He knows every little inch of creature or piece of planet that we're going through. All you gotta do is ask him and he'll tell you. So then when we get to go over there with the stunt performers or the actors and the actresses, you know, you just use your imagination. It's awesome. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, action! The thing that's hardest to understand about all this is we actually created two completely separate camera systems that had completely different jobs. Playback, action. One was our virtual camera system to capture actors in a virtual environment. And the other one was to shoot live action actors and sets in 3D. I fell in love with 3D when I made my first 3D film, which was in 95. And that was T2 3D. The logistics and the technology required were enormous. The cameras were the size of refrigerators. For Avatar, they develop uh, the most lightweight 3D system possible. So it's a very sophisticated technology. 
Fusion Camera was an outgrowth of all the 3D camera development that Vince Pace and I had done for several years previously. It was designed to be a state-of-the-art professional cinema camera for 3D production. So it needed to be faster, more responsive, more accurate, quieter to handle some of the issues that we knew we would find in a high budget feature. When we first looked at the camera system, we called it the reality camera system or the RCS because we were trying to mimic the human eyesight experience, so reality, if you will. Then Jim came with the name Fusion, which really is fusing creativity and technology. It's fusing the two images to form one, and that's really what we're doing. The design of the camera has been researched for a long period of time. What they've done is essentially assembled two cameras with a beam splitter that are able to simultaneously photograph two images at the same time and you have a series of servos that basically you can align the two images or disline them according to how much 3D you're looking for in a shot. I've never done a film in 3D, so the experimentation was really enticing for me. The fundamental principle is you shoot stereo like the human eye sees the world. Once you get that, there's actually very little that you have to think about to make it work. Your eye starts to accept it and you get this really immersive experience, which is what we really wanted Avatar to be. 3D is two camera systems that are trying to capture images very much like your own eyes are. And then we record those two separate streams of information to deliver them to the theater. When we get to the theater, we have to make sure that your right eye is only getting the right eye information and your left eye is getting the left eye information. This is one of our fusion camera systems. It was designed around one of the latest Sony systems. In this model here, you have two camera systems that are at a right angle to each other. So what you see in the front end is a mirror. We refer to it as a beam splitter mirror. And so one camera is shooting through the mirror and one camera is being reflected at a 90 degrees to the action, if you will. We call it a 50-50 split. 50% of the image goes to the camera, 50% of the image gets reflected away. And so in the end, you have two camera systems that are picking up the same image. And if you were to look at our images without the glasses on, your eyes would just be looking at a blurry image up on the screen. The minute you put on the glasses, we've redirected the two signals back to where they should be, just like they were captured. The right eye information from the right eye camera is going where it should be to the brain and the left eye is doing the same thing. And I must say, throughout the whole course of it, the interesting thing for me with Jim's relationship, he's taking camera systems that we just built, they're the most sophisticated camera systems ever put on a movie, and he always stayed grounded in the story. He didn't say, hey, look, we're gonna do this 3D film. He said, I'm gonna make Avatar. biggest challenges on this movie was James Horner's. How do you create music for a world that doesn't exist? When Jim wanted him and challenged him to combine indigenous sounds into a traditional cinematic score. But James was there all along the way. He came down and visited us in New Zealand. He came to the set when we were filming the scenes that had the music. He had to create music early on so that we could play it back during certain scenes. And I would say so many of the processes on this film were evolutionary. James would go off and he'd compose some stuff to templates of scenes, and then I'd get the music. Scenes would still be changing, the cut would be changing, and I'd put the music in, shift it around sometimes, say, hey, what about this? He'd say, oh yeah, that's great. He'd actually orchestrate it to fit more my cut of his sketches. So it was a very give and take process. Chair, you were last time I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jim Cameron, everybody. The first thing James did on this film was bring in an ethnomusicologist and start collecting sounds, vocal sounds, and various different instruments from around the world. <laughs> then he brought that all in to me to audition and say, well, what sounds like it might be Navi? And I said, you have to find ways to be alien, but be familiar. Because when you're playing an emotion, whether it's a triumphal chord in a battle, 
Oops. Or whether it's a sense of defeat or a sense of loss, whatever it is, that has to be recognizable. And he organically integrated that into what I think is his best score. What I did was I sampled a lot of interesting instruments and then I, I worked with them electronically to get an effect that was different than the instrument could make, but that had a kind of a weird spectral quality that made it sound like you really haven't heard it before, but it doesn't sound quite human either. And there were two women that just are professional singers and they just pinched off their voice to sound like sort of half African, half Navi children adult. A couple of days went by where we didn't really keep anything that was sung. It was just getting the right sound. Good one. Good one. No, we trust your ears. Yeah. Paul Frommer yeah. was the guy oh, yeah. who invented the language, and I yeah. asked him to write me syllables and consonants that I could use when my people were singing. I was true to the Navi language. a long time, this is the most fun we've had in, in a long time. And I think it's incredibly powerful. I and mean, I think he gets to these amazing kind of spiritual moments. He gets to these, you know, huge epic heroic moments. By the way, there are a number of composers that can do that epic heroic thing, but to integrate that all organically and always tell the audience exactly what they should be feeling without trying to force them to feel it, it should always accentuate beyond what you're already predisposed to feel. The idea was to take a motion capture stage and have a camera in it that the director could work with in real time. Run, run! This whole system has been... Right. Playback, action, boom! The virtual camera doesn't have a lens in the traditional sense. It's all created virtually in the computer. We tried to find a balanced design where we could put a monitor in an objective position for the cameraman to deal with, but still have a tactile experience of a camera. So if you think of what you're viewing as kind of like a really fancy video game engine that we're able to implement and show what's going on out here on the stage floor in real time through this screen. This top piece here emulates sort of the position of where the camera lens is. We're using our motion capture system to track this position as though it were a camera view into that world. With this technology, it's all real time so Jim can frame his virtual camera up and see his character there on the fly and say, okay, not only is my character here, I know exactly how to compose that angle, but I can move around it and I can see how the other characters interact and, and react to one another within that environment. So it gives him instant feedback. Bring the camera around and let's look at her. It's taking it from a point where you had to wait months to see something where he's getting it in real time. Action. This is him holding the camera, exploring these environments as if they were a live action set with performers that in his virtual camera look like the characters that are in the film, the fantastical characters that are in the film. 
sort of video game-like controls to it so that you can dolly yourself around, scale yourself up and down, you can make yourself a crane, you can put yourself on the back of a flying ship and, and act like you're doing air-to-air -air photography. All of these things are available just purely within this handheld device. It doesn't feel computer generated. It feels very alive and lifelike. You're watching yourself and the motion capture illusion that they created in a computer at the same time. Wow. What we did was we said, well, we have a fully virtual world. Let's shoot it in a, in a fully virtual way. It's basically as close to live action as one could get in a CG in invented world. Good. Hey, now don't close out, I've got some awesome movie extra trivia. One of the great pioneers of special effects was Ray Harryhausen. He pushed the limits of imagination, visual effects and miniatures in ways that inspired generations after him. One of his most famous moments in film was a scene in Jason and the Argonauts, where the hero had a sword fight with seven skeleton warriors. The scene was done with stop motion and took four months to complete. Hmm. Now do you like my shirt? You can get one for yourself in the shop section under the video.